This is the call to order of the Historic Preservation Commission meeting of March 10, 2020. Um, I understand that we have a new commissioner available this morning. And would you please like to say a few comments about your background and let us know how we, how we have been privileged to have you on this commission? You're, uh, you're oh. It's on? Okay. <laughs> I'm Carrie Ann Kanch. Um, I'm new to Tampa. I've been in Tampa for a year, but I lived in St. Pete for two years prior. So in the area, um, four years in June would be, yeah. And um, I am completing my master's. I did my course load, but I'm finishing my thesis um, from the School of the Art Institute of Chicago. Um, the Masters of Science in Historic Preservation program. And my undergrad is from Syracuse University in Interior Design. And um, yeah, Welcome. I've served on the Alachua County Historic Preservation in Gainesville before. And so this is kind of like my, my welcome to Tampa. So, yeah. well, welcome, thank you. Oh, thank thank you. you, we're glad to have you. And then we might as well continue from this direction. Oh, sure, and good morning. My name is Patricia Ortiz. Vivian Salaga, Preservation Architect. Tom Pluckon. Dominique Cobb, Urban Planner. Um, <clears throat> everyone should have had an opportunity to, <clears throat> excuse me, have read the, the minutes of the previous meeting of December. Um, are there any comments or remarks relative to those minutes? <clears throat> None here, thank you. Uh, hearing none, then may we have a motion to accept? So moved. Second. And I'll second. All right. The, all in favor? Aye. 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 Uh, the uh, minutes are approved as submitted. Um, Dennis Fernandez, administrator of the HPC, will make announcements. Good morning, commissioners. Uh, welcome to today's Historic <laughs> Preservation Commission. Uh, just briefly, I did want to also uh, welcome our legal counsel who's going to be assisting us here in, into the future, Camaria Pettis Mackle with the city attorney's office. Uh, so uh, we will be seeing uh, more of her as the uh, cycle continues on and welcome. And then also welcome to once again our commissioner, new commissioner, Ms. Kanch. Uh, we do appreciate you uh, volunteering to serve. She is appointed through city council as the board's alternate, but uh, obviously uh, we, we always have a need for uh, all of our members to participate, so welcome. Other than that, I think we're gonna move on to conflicts of interest and ex parte communication. Uh, I'll ask our legal counsel to lead that. Good morning, Kamaria pettis Mackle for the record from the city attorney's office. Um, council, at this time, can you please state on the record if there are any conflicts of interest um, regarding the items on the agenda or have any of the commissioners had any ex parte communication? None. Seeing none, um, may we please proceed with swearing in any witnesses? I do. Okay, with that, we're going to move to our first item of business. Uh, both of uh, the major items that we're dealing with today are uh, planning that the staff is engaged in. Uh, it's going to require limited, limited action by the board, but we do feel that both initiatives are substantial enough for you to be aware of them and to provide you some direction and for us to receive feedback. Um, so we're going to begin uh, item number seven with a PowerPoint. This is the Ybor City Preservation Park, and uh, Lane's going to lead that for me. Good morning, Commissioners. Um, Elaine Lund, Historic Preservation Staff. Um, <coughs> so I'm going to get our PowerPoint started here for this um, this discussion. Is it on your screens? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So um, the area that uh, we refer to as Preservation Park um, is located in the Ybor City Historic District. It's located within the um, the boundaries of it are located within the original National Register Historic District for um, Ybor City. 
Um, and then, of course, also within the local Ybor City Historic District and the National Historic Landmark District. Um, you can see here sort of a view of it. We're looking um, sort of northeast at the corner there. We're at the corner of Angel Oliva Senior Street, and that's sort of heading off to um, the left side of the screen there, and the street um, heading off to the right where you see the three buildings face it, facing is um, Ninth Avenue. So this is the location there on the uh, property appraiser's map. Um, you can see Palm Avenue to the north of the block, Angel Oliva Senior Street to the, um, the west, 19th Street to the east, and 9th Avenue on the south there. The only other thing on the block is the, um, the old um, Oliva Cigar Building that was um, fairly recently rehabilitated and is an exceptional project. Um, this is a closer view of the block and we'll see some of the shots of the pictures that are on that block, um, the pictures of the buildings that are on that block today. There's the, um, the Oliva building uh, on the top right, the uh, museum, which is the uh, old um, for leader or Broadway bakery building. That's the yellow brick one on the um, sort of the bottom to the right of the screen. And next to that is the building that's the museum's gift shop. That's the, um, um, the airplane bungalow is shown just to the right there. <laughs> and then we have the buildings that face East 9th Avenue to the south, which are um, used by, um, owned by the museum, well, all, yeah, owned by um, the museum, by the state, and one of them is used as a museum house. Um, and then there are buildings going around. You see the pictures of the buildings facing Angel Oliva Street and then facing, um, they're not on Palm, Ave Palm Avenue directly, but there's a little um, access parking area through there, so you can see them facing that spot off of the Angel Oliva Street there. So this is uh, Ybor City in 1957, and we're going to take a look at some of the changes here. In 1965, the interstate has come through Ybor City. Um, <laughs> Of course, the, there were some buildings that were taken out then, but by 1973, um, urban renewal has happened, and you see um, quite a bit of clearing in the, uh, the Ybor City area. In particular, um, most of the buildings north of 8th Avenue all the way up to the interstate between, I believe that's 13th or 14th maybe, and um, 22nd Street. <laughs> And additionally, of course, that's that area to the west there that's um, north of the, uh, the, is it the Tampa Park Apartments, I believe. So this is a closer view of um, the area where most of the, um, the land was cleared for urban renewal. Um, this is, the green area is the boundary of the first Ybor City Historic District that was placed on the National Register. And then I've got the, uh, the parcel map for the um, included the subject site that we're talking about today. So you can see that the, um, the National Register site took in most of the commercial buildings that were left. Um, you know, there's a lot of the fabric along 7th Avenue was still there, some of it on 8th, and then um, some of the, the major buildings like the um, Ybor Factory, uh, Cuban Club to the west there, the um, Florida breweries to the southeast, that's that little leg in the bottom left corner. And then, um, interestingly, we see this little jog up to the, uh, the north there where they took in just the, uh, pretty much just the site where the Oliva factory and the um, museum, well, now the museum, then the um, Broadway bakery. So there was some discussion about how to um, get that little area in the, uh, the National Register District, whether or not it should be included but ultimately it was decided to include it. Um, the state purchased uh, that site and turned the old Frulita Broadway Bakery into um, a state museum. So this is the map of the um, Ybor City Historic District, and I believe this is from around 1979, and then this is the kind of the blow up of that area um, where our subject site is. So you can see that there was not much um, 
left contributing or not around it. Um, to the to the right of this block, that's the uh, the fire station I believe that was constructed. Oh, that's the fire station. No, it was the fire station to sell. But there's a building constructed there in the late 70s. Um, you can see sheriff's office. Yeah, it's up there. Thank you. Um, and the um, Our Lady of Perpetual Help um, Church and School up to the just northeast of the site. So as um, this is the map in 1989 when um, the National Historic Landmark District with these was being proposed, and you can see that these buildings uh, that were not there a few years prior have been moved to the site off of um, 9th and Angel Luba Senior Street. So they're shown there as non-contributing buildings. And um, that's how they were at the time the National Historic Landmark District was um, adopted. So this is our current uh, map of the Ybor City Historic District. This is the one we use for our local historic district. Um, you see that there are buildings that are there are still shown as non-contributing. There's been um, some infill in the area. There's um, you know, the multifamily buildings to the north. Uh, the Hilton Garden Inn to the uh, the west, some additional new construction um, to the uh, southeast, the Centennial Park just to the south, which was um, developed around the same time that the Ybor State Museum was put in place. Or, um, and then to the, uh, the right along 19th Street, you see several buildings that um, have been relocated over the years to the, um, the blocks facing 19th Street. And those are buildings that were moved during the, um, the interstate expansion by the Florida Department of Transportation. And um, as part of the agreement with um, FDOT, those buildings were redesignated as contributing structures after they were relocated. So again, this is our, um, our aerial. You can see where the original building, the original uh, bakery building was, the garden area for the museum, and the buildings that were relocated to the site. And then in the early 2000s, another building was moved from um, 13th Avenue to be the, become the gift shop. So these are, um, let's see, the buildings on the right there are the three buildings that were relocated. And these were on um, facing East 9th Avenue and those were relocated from um, 1514, 1516, and 1518 East 5th Avenue, which is, I believe, on the block now where one of the um, parking garages is. So those were relocated in 1985, and that was done by the um, Florida Department of Natural Resources, which was then the um, division that included, uh, like this, that was over the state parks. Um, and the, uh, on the left there is just a picture of typical cigar worker housing from the 1920s. And then in the middle we've got a um, shot of uh, some of the conditions that were going on during urban renewal. Um, it's one of the houses that was going to be demolished. So these are all, um, we've got three different angles, but the buildings are very much the same here. So you can kind of see how they all look from the exterior. Um, these are simple uh, wood frame vernacular houses with a rectangular shotgun plan. Um, they have a simple building form, just a basic rectangle, a simple roof, the front facing gable. Um, they have decorative millwork on them, which is an easy thing to add after the fact once the building's been constructed. All the, um, the wood windows, doors, siding trim, uh, even the roof shingles are wood, the flooring and foundation screening, um, the brick piers. Everything has been um, on, this, on these buildings was, um, you know, preserved or rehabilitated um, to return these buildings to how they originally looked. Given that they were part of, um, there were other buildings along that block on Fifth Avenue where it looked like they were all built around the same time and all had the shape, same shape and form. They were probably all built by the same builder and probably all for the same purpose, a cigar factory. Um, housing. So inside, um, inside the museum house, which is 1804 uh, East 9th, they've restored it so that it's a um, very nice uh, museum building and showcases how the typical um, factory worker housing looked in, in those days. There are not very many rooms in here, obviously. 
Um, so in 1984 to 1986, uh, working with the Florida Department of Natural Resources, Tampa Preservation Inc. and the historic Tampa Hillsborough County Preservation Board relocated and rehabilitated three houses to the, um, the northwest side of that block, just north of the three houses that were relocated on, on the 9th Avenue. Um, you can see the site plan from 1984 and the, uh, the drawings showing the rehabilitation that was to occur on these structures. So these are um, different, different buildings, not all from the same location, not all um, built at the same time or by the same builder. There's three different vernacular forms found throughout Ybor City. So the, uh, the front gabled houses were probably originally located on narrower lots, and the, um, the side gabled house, the one on the right at 2007 Angel Oliva, um, could fit in a slightly larger lot. So that might have been a house where you know, maybe it wasn't somebody who you know, did some of the, the basic um, work in the factories, but maybe uh, um, you know, somebody a little mid-management perhaps, <laughs> we might think of them now, lived in a house like that. And again, all of the wood windows, door siding trim, um, some of the shingles, flooring, and foundations were all restored to how they would have looked originally. These houses all have um, metal roofs, and the one on 2007, Angel Oliva, I believe, has metal shingles, which is something that um, we don't see people using too much these days. So um, again, we've got the, uh, the house, the building at 1818 East 9th Avenue, which belonged to the Ferlita family and was the Broadway Bakery. Um, that's been in that location since its construction in the, um, the 20s, I believe. And the house at the corner, just to the east of it, 1820 East 9th Avenue, um, was relocated in 2002 and redesignated as a contributing structure to the local Ybor City Historic District in 2003. So looking at the, um, the, some of the old maps from around the time when, um, right before these buildings were relocated, this is the 1976 Sanborn map on the left, and then on um, the right there we've got our, you know, around 1970s, late 1970s, Ybor City Historic District map. Um, so you can see that we've got the, um, some of the houses that were relocated are highlighted in green there for you. The three that were on East 5th Avenue, um, 1514, 1516, and 1518 East 5th, were um, all considered contributing buildings before they were relocated, and as was the one um, to the south there at 1520 East 4th Avenue. Um, 911 East 9th Avenue, and this was one of the ones, this, I believe this is the one that was moved to 2007, Angel Oliva, uh, was also a contributing structure. And um, one of the houses, one of the other houses that was moved by um, Tampa Preservation Inc. was um, not shown on the original map, it was you know, beyond 22nd Street, so it's outside the, the boundary of that map, so we don't, um, really have the information as to whether it was considered contributing or not. However, given that the others all were, it's highly likely that it was selected because it still had a significant amount of its historic fabric intact. So um, this is the, again, the 1976 Sanborn map of that, uh, the block, where the, um, the museum and the Oliva factory were. Uh, all the X's on the buildings there show all the ones that were demolished by that point, um, I guess it was easier just to put X's on the buildings instead of you know, actually erasing them from the maps by that point. And then um, in 1987, we've got the aerial map here. Um, I picked this year just because it was after the buildings were moved and it didn't have as much tree coverage because so you can see the rooftops a little better. But you can see how the buildings were placed on the site to um, form, the intention was to form a typical Ybor City um, historic streetscape in their placement. So the, uh, the 1989 um, draft and the 1990 um, accepted report for the Ybor City National Historic Landmark District um, discusses the Preservation Park building under the heading Contributing Buildings and Features. So they thought they were um, s 
significant enough at that time, even though they didn't show them as contributing on the map, to discuss them um, and the, the relocation and rehabilitation of these buildings and you know, how they were put in place to uh, mimic the historic streetscape. Um, so we know that at least five of the six relocated casitas were considered as contributing structures before they were moved. And um, you know, staff's opinion is that the museum, they're museum quality structures and that they do contribute to the fabric of Eport City. Um, but they have been shown in all the maps as non-contributing since 1989. That picture there on the, uh, the right is um, the house that was moved from um, 911 East 9th Avenue, I think on its way to the, uh, the preservation park site there. So um, I have a picture here of uh, the work on the, um, the houses facing East 9th Avenue there, the Ybor City Preservation Park. Um, so what we're considering for our next steps um, are to initiate work to change the status of these buildings um, to be considered contributing structures to the local Ybor City Historic District. And we would also um, consider contacting the um, State Historic Preservation Officer to discuss the potential to change the status of these structures within the Ybor City National Historic Landmark District. And I think that's, yeah, the last slide there, so. Thank you, Elaine. As you can see, it, this is a project uh, that it took a great deal of coordination and many parties to be able to actually achieve this. And you can imagine kind of going back to when they were developing the State Museum site that they were uh, striving to have a level of authenticity with uh, the experience that the museum goers would have when they visited uh, the museum. Uh, that being said, um, there seems to have just been uh, somewhat of an oversight in that the buildings were never officially uh, made contributing again. Uh, it's been something that I've uh, been paying attention to for uh, many years. We haven't had the opportunity, I think, uh, to, to, to go forward with it, which I, I believe now with the revitalization of the Oliva tobacco building uh, presents us with an opportunity because there's been site improvements uh, around the structures as well. Um, additionally, I think there's a, a level of development pressure in Ybor City now that didn't really previously exist until the last few years, which elevates the importance of protecting structures that uh, meet criteria for designation and that, um, you know, I mean, you know, frankly, they're, they're museum quality structures. They're some of the finest uh, examples um, that are within the district of the period of significance era structures. So uh, we, felt it's, uh, we felt strongly that we should uh, place this on the agenda for discussion today. Um, uh, working with the state uh, can uh, be complicated sometimes, but we think it's essential that we uh, obviously, they are the property owner, so it's essential that we um, involve them and uh, hopefully be able to um, work with them to not only change the status uh, locally, but to also have these added as contributing structures within the National Historic Landmark District. So um, that's the that was the uh, intent of. Uh, this presentation, and I wanted to open the floor for any discussion, concerns, or requests that you might have as well. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dennis and Elaine. That was really a, a very, very interesting presentation of the, the of the evolvement of the that block and those structures. Um, commissioners, have you any comments or? that you would like to make? <laughs> it seems like a pretty clear case of the, the loss of integrity location, the <coughs> setting and the association are, are con, you know, pretty close to the original. Um, I hate to s get, give the DOT the message that they can continue moving buildings and they'll put them back <laughs> on the National Register, but yeah. um, I think the benefits in this case are 
would certainly have to lay that down. Now, is there anything further that you would be bringing back to this commission in order to pursue these these requests at the state level, even at the local right. level? Um, so my hope would be that uh, we do get to move forward with um, their reclassification to contributing structures both on the national and the local level. On the uh, national level, uh, our role as a certified local government uh, involves us in making recommendations to the National Register Review Board. So um, at the time that that does occur, then we would be uh, placing, we would be notified, we would bring that back to you and, and then want a, a formal motion from the commission to the National Register Review Board um, with our, uh, our position on the listing. Um, separate from that, uh, working to amend the uh, local designations, we would have to engage in a process, obviously, of public notice, scheduling that on a future agenda. Uh, we would begin, I had actually intended, I didn't get an opportunity to speak with uh, the State Historic Preservation Office yesterday, but I didn't intended on, on a, reaching out to them and at least having a um, conversation while we assembled the materials to send to them and to, to see if this was even something that they uh, were aware of. Uh, I, I believe it probably not, uh, although it's, it's kind of an interesting um, position between multiple departments at the state level that are kind of dealing with the same property because we do interact with uh, the, the park maintenance component uh, from the state uh, when they want to do a reroute or, or work during the architecture review process. So um, currently there's not a need for action from the board, but uh, in the future we do see the need for uh, action in uh, both the National Register recommendation, uh, uh, the change in classification at the local level, and then amending the inventory of historic resources and the maps to reflect them as contributing structures. I did, do want to mention that I've had some outreach from the community who, who have a, an, a concern about the, the current non-contributing um, classification. So I think you know once we get past this initial phase, we'll we'll have some some level of support from the community as well in, in moving this forward. Excellent. Well, this um, in the process of revising the maps, will this require? Um, a revision to their master site files, uh, updating those as a part of that process. Right. We we would we would work with the state on updating those documents. Um, there are uh, there's obviously a, a great deal of documentation to show where the structures were. Um, it's one of the better documented uh, type of relocation projects that we have. So we're fortunate there. Um, I think, you know, it's, it's, it's an interesting lesson in how preservation programs have become more formalized and professional uh, when you look at the second phase uh, of the relocations that happened adjacent to this through the FDOT. And through that entire process, there, were, um, there was an agreement that when those structures that now uh, are situated on 19th Street and and the museum store on 9th Avenue were relocated. It was agreed long before they were ever relocated that the structures were going to be redesignated as contributing both to the national districts and to the local historic mm -hmm. districts. And that's why you see on the map that those are shaded in, indicating that they had been redesignated. Those all came through um, the HPC for redesignation uh, when they were they were moved. And it was much, it's very similar, you know, in looking at the history of this, the uh, level of coordination and community engagement was very similar uh, to Preservation Park as it was to the second phases of relocations. It was all intended to preserve and to recreate uh, the, uh, <coughs> the setting and the, the, the feel for the historic district, which I think they all had have been successful in doing so. Well, thank you. I'm, I know I, for one, will be 
supporting whatever endeavor is going on there because this is really vital and critical to the Ybor City history and the documentation of its history. It's really sad to see what happened when that highway came through. Oh my goodness. It's pretty dramatic. I think that's you know one pretty of the reasons dramatic. that we and that it we wasn't exist the, today. It <laughs> wasn't to, the only historic district no. affected by that highway either. Yeah. But very dramatic. Yeah. Thank you. So we will be back uh, to you. Uh, I'll have uh, probably by the next meeting I'll have a better idea of time frame which I'll I'll update you at, at that meeting. Mm -hmm. um, moving on to item seven or eight rather, uh, which is uh, Port Tampa. Uh, this is an area that uh, staff has uh, been monitoring uh, in, in the recent past as development has increased uh, within that general neighborhood. I wanted to uh, provide you with uh, an overview uh, and then have, uh, once again, have some discussion on next steps for that particular um, area of town. And Elaine's going to uh, familiarize you with another PowerPoint. So again, Commissioners Elaine Lund, Historic Preservation Staff. Um, so, as Dennis was saying, this is our uh, discussion of the Port Tampa um, city area. Um, Port Tampa s was a city from 1893 through 1961 when it was annexed into the city of Tampa. Um, <clears throat> taking a quick look at our uh, 1882 map of Hillsborough County here. This was when um, Hillsborough County also included what is now Pinellas County. Um, the arrow um, more north to the top there is pointing at the, uh, what was the, um, the Tampa area, the Tampa City at that time, um, in the Fort Brook area. That's at the, um, about where the Hillsborough River empties into the um, Hillsborough Bay. And then Port Tampa was at the, um, the southwest point of the Inner Bay Peninsula that you see the Inner Bay Peninsula, of course, being between the old Tampa Bay and Hillsborough Bays. And um, that point there was uh, had a few different names over the year, but it was one of its, um, one of its uh, names, I guess, closest to the time uh, it became more developed was Black Point. I think it was also called Passage Point, perhaps, at some point in its history. So this is um, 1892 is when um, Port Tampa City was platted, um, was platted by um, Mr. Prescott and, um, sorry, my notes are a little scattered this morning, excuse me. Um, I can't quite make that out here, but I'll get back to his name in a minute. Um, so it was flatted by two of the men who worked for Henry B. Plant, the, uh, the railroad um, entrepreneur there. Um, this is uh, kind of how Port Tampa City looked over the years. The Sanborn maps were, um, are the, the two colored maps that you see popping up there. And um, by 1931, you can see the areas that were developed sufficiently to be um, considered uh, deemed necessary to map for insurance purposes by the Sanborn um, Fire Insurance Company. Um, you can also see where the uh, shipping canal was at, that went out into the, uh, the bay, um, some of the oil um, containers, and uh, a good, uh, good deal of area that was not included in the, um, the Sanborn, uh, on the Sanborn maps. So Port Tampa City's history really begins with um, Henry Plant coming, bringing his railroad to Tampa. Um, his railroad reached Tampa in 1884, and then by um, 1887, it was um, headed down, 
headed down the, uh, the Inner Bay Peninsula toward Black Point, which um, Henry Plant renamed Port Tampa. He built this, um, this uh, sort of dock um, and port out into the water about a mile out so that it could reach the, um, the natural channel that led into the bay out there. He did do a little bit of a dredging to make the bay a little deeper, but generally it was an ideal location for him at that time to set up um, his, uh, to bring his trains down so that you know, they could reach the ships that would come into the um, Tampa Bay. The um, Hillsborough Bay, which comes up into, um, toward downtown Tampa today, was not deep enough for larger ships to reach so that, um, when plants started uh, working with the phosphate companies and started buying phosphate um, mines, he was able to <coughs> bring the phosphate directly down to Port Tampa to be loaded onto the ships to be exported to, um, to other countries where, for, where it would be refined. Um, so the, uh, the ships and the rail lines and the hotels, such as the, uh, the Port Tampa Inn and um, the uh, St. Elmo, in there that you see right off the, uh, the pier were all part of the plant system. Um, the other hotels, obviously, the uh, um, Tampa Bay Hotel, uh, now home to the University of Tampa, and um, some others throughout the state were constructed so that they would, they were attractive resort destinations. So in addition to um, having to travel for any other purposes, people would also be like, oh, well, let's, you know, they would want to go to these really nice resorts, so that gave them an excuse to uh, have to travel on Plants Railroad to get there. Um, the ships would also take people to uh, other um, ports like Cuba, travel to um, Key West, and um, I believe Mobile. So um, Henry Plant also had the foresight to see that this would be a wonderful location for the um, United States Army to set up its uh, sort of its point of embarkation for the Spanish-American War. He worked closely with Congress to um, encourage them to uh, to use the site, and um, you know that helped develop his uh, his rail lines and his um, his port very much, and it also brought a great deal of notoriety to Port Tampa. Um, the, uh, the soldiers who were stationed at Port Tampa were there for a considerable period of time just waiting to be able to board the ships. Um, so we have a lot of photos of you know, the soldiers camped in this area and in other parts of Tampa. Um, and the picture on the right there is a, um, I forget who the, uh, the preacher is, but the, the arrow there is pointing to um, Theodore Roosevelt when he was in, in Port Tampa. And then the picture on the left is, um, I believe, one of the unions that uh, worked on the um, worked on the rail lines and on the ships. Um, of course, there were several people who had to you know, work, uh, who were brought to Port Tampa for work, being um, you know, working the rails, being rail crew, and um, being stevedores for the ships, and um, of course also like you know, ship crew. So. There were frequently people um, in and out of Port Tampa, but overall it was um, a, uh, still a pretty like um, quiet area, I suppose. It's a good way to say it. You can see the small church in the background behind uh, the Union there, some of the smaller buildings. There was not a lot of intense rapid growth in this area. So the, the port did continue to develop as a, um, a major phosphate shipping area, um, even after um, Henry Plant passed and his lines were bought out by the Atlantic coastline. Um, even, I believe, through 1936. I want to say that's in the 1936 photo on the right, that's the last um, phosphate elevator that was constructed there, but it was still in use for um, several decades. So some of the other development that occurred in Port Tampa City since um, you know, they did have 
a good base of um, population base from the port activities. Um, you see the, uh, the general merchandise store. Um, there was a sort of a bathing and fishing pier that was constructed by Port Tampa City that's a little bit to the north of the, um, the shipping pier. And um, some of the, the commercial corner there on the right. Um, and of course, um, when World War II was approaching and um, the Army was looking for a good air base in uh, Florida, there was this swath of land um, just adjacent to Port Tampa City that was available. And uh, in 1939, um, the MacDill Field began to be developed. So there's a, an early shot of MacDill Field on the, uh, the left there, and you can almost make out the, um, the shipping pier on the other side of the, uh, the peninsula. Um, and of course, there's a photo of uh, MacDill from the, its early years on the right. Um, you can kind of tell how ideal Florida is for, uh, for air bases there, just given the, the flatness of the landscape. So the um, having the air base um, on in the nearby gave rise to a lot of new construction in Port Tampa City. Um, there's a lot of you know housing, base housing, or off base housing rather that was constructed. Um, you can see some of the uh, how the area sort of looked in the I think I believe this is um, late 50s or early 60s in the aerial photo below. Um, the Atlantic coastline and its Port Tampa terminals uh, continued to develop into the 60s, um, being both still an export um, facility for phosphates and imports for gas and oil. Um, and then, of course, the, uh, the fire station that you see on the left there is um, one of the last structures that was constructed by Port Tampa City, um, I believe in 1959. Uh, shortly before Port Tampa City was annexed into the city of Tampa. So um, when we look at Port Tampa, we can make out a few sort of general areas of significance. Um, this slide was um, taken from the Old St. Mark's um, Community Aid Center designation, landmark designation, so it's a, just sort of an example of what you might see for buildings in Port Tampa. Um, community planning and development would be an area of significance for uh, resources in Port Tampa. Um, <clears throat> they'd be representative <clears throat> of the important areas in the history and development of Port Tampa City. Um, in this case, Criterion B, African American Heritage, was met. Um, this was a significant site uh, for early African Americans in Port Tampa City, <clears throat> as it was one of the, um, the, the one of the, the first um, church buildings that was provided for them. The um, architecture in Port Tampa City, this is a pretty, um, can be a pretty good category to define um, buildings, obviously. So we have, uh, like this church, there are several, um, well, there are other uh, churches that are representative of this early church form in the, uh, the Port Tampa area that are, um, from around the time of the Spanish-American War when there were several soldiers there. Um, there are other representative architectural styles, including some that we don't see too many of around the rest of the city. Um, so it's, a, it's an interesting area. So we, um, looking at areas of significance for Port Tampa, when we look at the, the architecture, we would talk about you know, not only the higher style buildings and the significant um, you know, cultural and community buildings, but also like um, the residential architecture, anything from like the little houses that um, were built by Henry Plant that might still be remaining in the area for the workers to the houses um, that were built for like the ship captains um, and so on. So again, this is the uh, Old St. Mark Community Aid Center, which we designated as the City of Tampa um, Local Historic Landmark in 2018. Um, represented of the, uh, the early church architecture in Port Tampa and associated with the African American history of Port Tampa. Um, another landmark that we have in Port Tampa is the uh, Commercial Bank Building, 
which is now the Port Tampa Library. Um, this was constructed in 1926 for the Bank of Port Tampa. The architectural style is uh, unique to Port Tampa and it's also one that is not, um, not remaining in many places um, around the city still. Um, it was designated as a local historic landmark in 1994. The uh, Johnson Wolf House is not a, it's not a local landmark, but it was listed in the National Register of Historic Places in 1974. Um, it was constructed in 1883, but it was altered to its current appearance around 1893 when Captain Henry Johnson um, purchased it and adapted it to his tastes. So it's a had that look for a long time. <laughs> um, so the survey work in Port Tampa began as early as 1973. I believe there were some uh, volunteers with Tampa Preservation Inc. that did survey a few sites um, in, that, uh, in that year. Uh, most of the early surveys were limited to the more significant sites. Um, you know, most of the work was not well funded and um, was done using volunteers, so um, you would get a variety of um, forms that were you know, very well filled out or only had like, minimal details on them using you know, volunteer work like that. And um, most of the early surveys were actually limited to the, um, the more northerly part of Port Tampa there. If you kind of draw a straight line um, from, the, from the dock across to the east, um, most of the houses north of that were the ones that were surveyed early, and most of the houses south of that were not added until the, um, I believe, the, were not surveyed until the 2002 survey. So um, there are not many buildings remaining in that area on the, the south, um, sort of the southwest side of Port Tampa, but the ones that were there were more likely to have been like the worker housing and the, um, the smaller, um, less elaborate structures while the uh, shipping captains and the pilots' houses were located in the, uh, the northern part of Port Tampa. <laughs> so um, the surveys that have occurred in Port Tampa have identified 144 historic structures. Um, I, you know, there's pretty uh, clear, I'm gonna move back a bit. It's pretty clear that there's more than 144 structures in Port Tampa that would meet the um, requirements for this sort of um, survey work. If you look at this map here, this is, uh, I think, the 2013 aerial. And if I can catch it before I get my uh, little housing picture in here, you can see, um, there we go, the change, and there's some development in the south there. Oops, there I am. So there are some new subdivisions that have come in and are starting to take over the, uh, the southern end of Port Tampa there. Yeah. So, and then um, we have pictures of some of the infill construction that's been coming into Port Tampa as well. Um, so what we're considering looking at one possibility for the historic resources in Port Tampa is to do a multiple property designation. We currently have five other multiple property designations in the um, city including um, the Beach Park area with 10 total structures in it, the um, historic bridges over the Hillsborough River, which has six bridges, the historic Central Avenue area, African American Heritage Sites, um, sort of east of downtown, um, has five structures. North, Tam North Franklin Street in downtown is 12, and West Tampa has three. West Tampa is also a National Register Historic District, um, but locally we only have um, we have buildings throughout it that are individual landmarks, and then we have three structures that are part of a uh, multiple properties designation for West Tampa. So the, um, the multiple properties designation is sort of an umbrella nomination. I should probably um, backing up a little bit when I was talking about areas of significance. Um, the umbrella designation would include a discussion of everything that um, would make buildings in Port Tampa, um, um, everything that would make them significant, everything that they would be associated with, like the early, um, the early uh, railroad industry, the early shipping industry, um, anything from the Spanish-American War era, um, 
the early growth in the, um, the early 20th century growth, um, World War II, and perhaps after development in Port Tampa as well, or any significant architectural styles, or anything associated with um, significant people or significant um, communities. So um, we need to do a little more research to sort of define this and to also take a closer look at um, the areas that have been surveyed, see what else really needs to be looked at. There's, um, it's, a, it's not a, a huge, um, you know, physically not a huge area, but it's um, a very dense, densely um, developed area. So um, we need to take a, a closer look at the individual structures in Port Tampa, um, coordinate with the Port Tampa Civic Association and do some outreach with property owners possibly if we um, move forward on this. Um, going back to discuss a little bit about some of the prior surveys that have been done in this area. Um, I believe the 1979 was one of the, um, 1973 and then 1979 was, I think the 1979 survey was kind of an extension of the, uh, the 1973 work that was, field work that was done. Um, but I believe the, uh, the recommendation in that time for Port Tampa was that it did not have a sufficient collection of historic structures to be considered for a historic district. Um, they did consider it a distinct community and that um, stated that much the, um, the, what remained of its cultural and architectural history should be preserved. Um, and specifically, they uh, talked about its charm being in the residential core area that was north of, uh, on the north side of Port Tampa. Um, in, this was in 1987, and the 1987 survey of the historic resources of um, Port Tampa, the suggestion was that, um, so again, that there was not a sufficient um, density or architectural integrity for a historic district, but that some of Tampa's earliest examples of um, housing were in this area, and at that time they suggested a neighborhood conservation district to be established. Um, there has been some discussion as well about doing the multiple property designation, and um, you know, in lieu of having a cohesive um, contiguous area with a sufficient density of historic structures, that would be considered contributing a multiple properties designation is a um, a good direction to consider going to take in the uh, you know, the buildings that you know otherwise could make up a historic district or that otherwise could be considered individual um, historic landmarks. So uh, with that, I'll hand this back over to Dennis. Thank you, Lane. That's a great presentation. Obviously, a lot of work. Uh, is gone into that. Um, one thing I wanted to uh, convey to the commission is that um, we've been working on uh, evaluating the uh, survey aspects of Port Tampa for several months in the office. Um, so we've, we've got spreadsheets and cell sheets and kind of seeing what was there, what's gone, what would be an appropriate period of significance. Uh, there's, there's somewhat of a dual nature of uh, the um, characteristics of the area, its relationship to early development in the Spanish-American War, and then that period after World War I when it began to really be an economic engine uh, with uh, the port continuing uh, until the point it was um, incorporated into the city of Tampa as a whole. Uh, staff's been out to the neighborhoods before over there. Uh, we've, um, we've discussed historic preservation with them. It, it was met at that point with sort of a mixed response uh, a few years back. But we have been noticing a uptick in demolitions in the area and recently had gone out to a, a early 20th century structure that had kind of fallen into disrepair and was uh, being uh, reviewed for demolition, which we ultimately approved. 
Um, that being said, some of the older structures, the you know, sea captains' homes and those prominent individuals that were involved in um, the steamship industry, uh, they usually sit on large parcels, multiple parcels, sometimes four to six parcels, which is a very attractive uh, target for redevelopment. Um, so we've, we've uh, you know, f feel that this has sort of risen to a level where, once again, it, it necessitates uh, staff time, and that's why we felt that it was important to place on the agenda. I also um, was going to initiate outreach with the neighborhood, and I like to uh, bring this to the commission before I kind of enter that phase of the program. Um, so next steps in this particular uh, location would be to continue staff documentation within the office and sort of refine our list. We're, we're actually going through property by property at this time and, you know, looking at examining the, um, the properties to determine their level of integrity that, that remain. Uh, and then reaching out to the neighborhood, have a discussion about preservation, particularly uh, with an aspect of a multiple property designation. It, it tends to be uh, better received than the discussion on local historic districts, mm -hmm. which I think this area would be difficult to assemble uh, in, in the same context of how our existing local historic districts are formulated and evaluated. Uh, and then, obviously, uh, bringing information back to you for the next phase when we would then uh, reach out to property owners individually and um, solicit uh, engagement and designation. Um, so I see this probably coming back to you later this year. We would like to have uh, at least the uh, interaction with the property owners occur within this year. Um, so, you know, you could plan to see that back and of course we would, we would update you along the way. So if there's any questions or any discussion on this, we're happy to uh, answer any questions that you may have. Thank you. Commissioners, any, any comments or questions to um, the staff? I'm actually excited to hear a bit more information about Port Tampa because I know that it contributed a lot of, um, growth for Tampa, so I'm excited to definitely hear more. I guess just a quick question is, uh, Your microphone's not on. Multiple property listing at local level uh, uh, has the same protection as a contributing member of a district, essentially, and is what's the review process? Is it go ARC? So uh, uh, multiple property <laughs> listings <laughs> are uh, essentially a grouping of landmarks. Yeah. They're just related, uh, you know, by some characteristic. Uh, that's why you saw the different you saw the different categories that have been established through this commission over the years. Um, it's a it's a, a more effective way of uh, relating historic properties than just doing uh, unrelated uh, landmark designations. Initially, when the programs began, that was sort of the trend was just to landmark, 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 and not really have these groupings and it's kind of led to a, a, a little confusion over the years so we it's a for when we do more than three properties as a landmark uh, typically we're gravitating towards a multiple property listing and and they're they're a, a, a thematic listing that's uh, mirrored at the national level as well um, Dennis one thing that that interests me is um I'm just wondering, do you know the impetus of annexation? Like, wh why was Port City, uh, excuse me, um, why, why was this area annexed into the city of Tampa? Uh, I don't have all the answers. I'm sure that it, it had to do with efficiencies of services. Okay. And, and uh, probably, you know, public uh, infrastructure. Um, but we can get more information uh, for you on, on exactly why. Yeah. I know that there's some opinions in the neighborhood about how it happened. 
I'm just curious. Um, I think what one of the, the interesting things to me about Hillsborough County is um, it's very limited number of municipalities. You know, um, when we think of Pinellas County, I think there are something like 30 um, <laughs> different cities. And in Hillsborough County, we only have the three and a large unincorporated mm -hmm. county area. Um, so I just kind of wondered why that was. Um, I do think that your approach of doing a, a multiple property grouping um, for a designation is, is probably the right approach here. I do, I do understand that this will be a significant amount of work, but I, I do think it's very important. So. Thank you. Thank you. I have a question regarding the multiple properties designations on the slide previous to this one there were a number of different categories including the bridges and and a few other areas around are is it the intention to include all of those different areas in one multiple property listing or would each of those like the bridges for example be their own multiple property designation port tampa would be its own and and the others that were on that list how does that happen? so the ex existing multiple property listings are already established and um, <laughs> so uh, with those uh, for instance um, when we have a property downtown that we are working on adding into that mul multiple property listing it's been previously um, delegated to the staff uh, that that does not need to come back to the board for an initiation because it's within the established multiple property listing. So we just basically, when we when we do have those properties, I think the one, uh, the bank building downtown was the last one. That we did. Um, Madison. So we had a, the 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 um, international design bank building that we did downtown a few years ago was the last one that we had in the downtown multiple property uh, grouping. Mm -hmm. So um, those come back to you as, as, as we are working with property owners and then we engage and go through the notice process. The, uh, the creation of a new one would um, uh, occur through this board. It would also go to the Hillsborough County City, City County Planning Commission for uh, recommendation when it was established uh, in tandem with whatever properties were included within that grouping and then we would just continue obviously if we like with Beach Park we we started out I believe with six structures and we've been able to add a few additional through the years and we would just keep continue to build those multiple property listings to give them uh, integrity <clears throat> Does that answer your question? Yes, it does. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Thank you. I, I believe that's the conclusion of comments or questions from the commission on that issue. And then we'll move on to item nine, the Ybor City Local Historic District guidelines update. So uh, last time that I provided an update on this, this is an item that we've had on here reoccurring to, to keep you updated on the progress. Uh, the last time that I brought uh, information, I believe in December, I had indicated that we had uh, been soliciting the pre-qualified firms that met the criteria through, um, through our contract administration division. So uh, we've, we've exhausted that list of those pre-qualified firms um, that would be um, uh, adequate or that's not the word that would be um, experienced in uh, creating this district design guidelines for historic mm -hmm. resources um, unfortunately uh, we weren't able to get any of the firms who had been pre-qualified to agree to do the project no. uh, not not because the project's uninteresting or, or unfunded but because they're just overwhelmed with the amount of work that they currently have. So uh, that being said, uh, I have uh, recently met with our procurement division and we've decided to um, issue a request for proposals on this particular item, uh, which I uh, am happy about because it will give us a further reach uh, beyond just our county and 
actually it would go out on a system called Demand Star mm -hmm. that reaches out uh, far beyond our, our municipality. Uh, additionally, we can, um, we can uh, embed firms that we know that do this type of work in the advertisement for it. Mm -hmm. So uh, other firms that we're familiar with who have done uh, historic resource uh, and master planning work on historic properties and districts, uh, we can add those to our solicitation list. Mm -hmm. So um, looking at moving this forward pretty rapidly now that we've sort of charted, pivoted and charted this course. Um, so by our next meeting in May, I would hope that that would uh, at least be out there and being advertised and uh, waiting responses on it. So that's a, that's a good uh, move for us. So that, um, that those comments conclude the uh, agenda items uh, and um, the next date and time of our meeting will be May 12, 2020 at 9 a.m. in these chambers. Uh, are, there, are there any items of new business that the staff would like to raise or anyone on the commission? Hearing none, then I declare the meeting adjourned at uh, 10.04 a.m. Thank you all very much. Thank you.